Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. We are here with the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Bob Moran. Bob, How are you? How are you? I'm great, man. Great for coming to the show. I know you are busy, you know, listeners, Bob runs the oldest women's only tournament in the United States. Uh, still active. It's the, Charles, it's the Credit One Charleston Open, formerly the Volvo Open, formerly the Family Circle Cup. That's right. And now they got a new name and a new stadium or renovated stadium. It's new. Oh, wow. Is it new? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it feels awful new, Kamal. Let me tell you. Well, I can't wait to see because I, I was there when it was raining and we were hiding under the bleachers looking for shelter. <laughs> And, and and Vika Azarenka was playing Blame It on the Rain. Yeah, Purple Blue Rain. Light. We had all of it going that night. <laughs> so, listeners, we are in for a treat. We are going to talk a little bit about tournaments, how do we keep them alive, how do we create more women's events, the challenges, and the opportunities. So, Great. Bob, I got to ask, you know, because we did three women's events last year mm -hmm. in Chicago, and it's hard work. Yes. Uh, Aside from the sponsors, obviously, that, that helped make this thing happen, how have you been able to keep it alive for so long? Well, I think, we, you know what, Kamal, you started off with it. We have a great history in the sport. And, you know, it started, you know, 50 years ago for us in, in Hilton Head in 1973. You know, there's a lot of people who argue with me about, you know, what, uh, what anniversary means and all that. And all I know is this is our 50th tournament. So to me, that's 50 years. If this is your 50th event, that's what it is. Um, most people, some people say I should be celebrating that next year, but I, I kind of, we, uh, <laughs> we make our own decisions on that. Um, but I think it, it, the, his, the strong history has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, we're a women's event, but we've had a stadium that was built just for women, which means a lot. Um, and then, you know, we have been able to build a culture here of uh, tennis in Charleston, which it's amazing to me to watch where it started. And I'm talking, you know, recreational tennis. I'm talking junior tennis. Um, that all helps. There's a there's an ecosystem in tennis in Charleston. And I'll tell you what, I am a big believer that professional tennis helps drive recreational tennis and junior tennis all the way down. And um, I, I think that's that's one thing when we've been losing tournaments in the U.S. over the last many years, it, it worries me. And I think successful events absolutely 100 percent come from building a great ecosystem and spending that full year in the market. We're here every day promoting tennis, teaching tennis. It's, it's important to us. And I think that's why we've been able to build a fan base and continue to grow the way we're growing. Now you talk about all year because, you know, I think maybe two or three years ago, you guys started having UTR tournaments, uh, 125s, you know, where did that, that, you know, impetus come from to start kind of activating it all year? Cause that definitely helps like this big, this is like you all Super Bowl coming up. Absolutely. You know, it, it, this, this is the Super Bowl, no question about it, but it, again, it goes back to, and we, we, we have new leadership in the Navarro family and Ben Navarro, who is a big believer in tennis and believer in, uh, in junior tennis and growing up from every stage. So we have an academy here. We, you just mentioned all the tournaments that we're operating. It's because he's a steward of tennis. He believes that. And I believe it hundred percent with what he's shown us is that he wants to be a steward of tennis. So if we can bring an event, be at the U S girls clay courts we've hosted for the last few years, to the challengers, to um, ITF events, to anything we can to continue to build, we're going to do it. And it's um, and I think it, it again, it all is driven from the top. And Ben has been that leader and pushing us to do more. And I mean, it really is. He's pushing us to do more. Now, we've seen like you know the women's tournaments pop on the calendar, pop off. We saw Lexington pop on. We got Cleveland now. What do you think the challenge is? Because we would think like in America, we've got a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of corporations, a lot of money, big advocates for women's sports. Um, what are the challenges? I mean, I know, you know, in Chicago, we're, we're trying to get a sanction as well. Yeah. What are the challenges you think to trying to, A, create more women's events? And not only the 125, which are a lot, a very doable, but also the 250s where some of the, you know, uh, European players want to stay and play. Um, Yep. And where you can get a top 10. 
right? There's not like that limitation now on. What do you think we have to do to sort of, to get that going? We have to fix it. We have to fix the tour. And wow, I'm going to get in a soapbox and I'm going to get in trouble for this. And that's okay. Because I, as I saw you for a few minutes in Miami, but we had some, some good meetings in Miami and, you know, we had a, a great player council and tournament council meeting and we had this discussion. How do we fix it? And I think it's circuit structure. We've got to figure out circuit structure and how do we get players playing each other more often? How do we support those, those 250 events? I'll use for an example. I think the 250 is really hard economically to make work. It's hard. But if we can get a top 10 player or a strong regional player to support an already strong field, and then help it economically from a central point of view, I think we can make that work. But we've got to get players playing those big events, that next level down, those 250s, let's get them working. And if you want to work your way up into those big events, you got to win your way up into those big events. There's got to be mobility both up and down. But I think between you have your uh, premier events, your 250s, your 125s, and then so on and so forth down. And I think in order to make those 250s work, We've got to we've got to create a better system and a better, I would say, um, business plan for that. And I think that's that's in play. We're all talking about how do we do it. You know, sometimes come out, it's, it's difficult to get around um, that we've been doing the same thing for this, the same way for a long time. And we've got to get people to believe that change is good right now because we can't continue down the path we are because you gave great examples of events that come and go. We need consistency. So we need a great business plan and then we need a plan for players. So they're not killing themselves trying to keep a schedule. That's just not feasible. Does that make sense? Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. That was uh, well said. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I look at like other sports, right? I look at like the NBA, I've got, you know, one of my best, well, a lot of my best friends play in the league. Uh, you look at baseball and you see how every year they're changing, whether it's, you know, CBAs, uh, structure, NFL, right? Changing the playoffs, number of teams to get in the playoffs. Um, what do, why do you think tennis, I look at our sport, right? And I look at like sort of the historical, like Wimbledon is like the holy grail of tennis, right? It'll probably never change. It's like moving the Titanic. Yep. Um, and not saying that it needs to change, but it just is what it is. But if you look at like our league, it seems like we are, very slow to adapt, well, very hey, slow to change and innovate. Come on, who's who's in charge of the NFL? Players. The N, the NFL. Oh, yeah, the NFL, yeah. yeah. Who's in charge of Major League Baseball? Major League Baseball. Who's in charge of the PGA Tour? The PGA Tour. Who's in charge of tennis? I want you to give me an answer right now. I think Who's the in charge? <laughs> who's in nobody. charge? Yeah. Nobody. Every, nobody. Nobody and everybody. We nobody have, everybody. A bunch, bunch of agencies, players, staff. You have WTA, ATP, Grand Slams, ITF, all with a leadership role in some way, shape, or form. Don't and we all Jack don't. Cup Davis Cup. Well, that's under ITF. Yeah. Right. And we all don't work together. You know, when you're putting events on the Davis Cup and the Fed Cup side in the middle of an ATP season and WTA season, and everyone's talking about player health, how can it be healthy to finish Charleston, for example? And then players will go all across the globe, all across the globe to play. And then they all got to go back to Stuttgart, which is the next WTA event. So mm -hmm. for me, we have all of these entities that um, don't really do a great job working together. And again, I, you know what I'm saying, what I say, because I believe we have un unbelievable potential for this sport, but we all got to start working together. ATP, WTA, Grand Slams, ITF. If we're not working with each other on schedule, if we're not working with each other on the rules of the game, on everything that goes on, it's amazing to sit there and look at ITF rules, Grand Slam rules, ATP rules, and WTA rules. How is a player supposed to keep track of everything that's different? That's hard. Well, the other thing is, too, is let's say, let's say Charleston, for example, right? After Charleston, you got Billie Jean King Cup, which is on an indoor hard court, right, for the American players. Yep. And so as a coach, that's the decision. Do you start your clay court season? Mm -hmm. Do you then go play indoor or hard court? Yep. And then do you go back to clay in Stuttgart or, you know, you know, whatever, you know, Madrid, Rome, that kind of thing. And so, again, that's like, you know, one hand not talking to the other. And then everybody's sort of pinned in the middle because you want to 
support your country, but do you want to go way over there and have to come back over here, right? Yeah. It, so these that, are the decisions that aren't fair. They're not fair to tournaments. They're not fair to players. And it's those, those are the decisions that they're forced to make, which make it very, very awkward and very, um, you know, it, for us, it's like, wow, we're working our rear ends off to build a great event. We just invested a ton of money in a new facility. And, you know, there's others making decisions that affect the calendar that we can't even, no one can even ask our opinion, let alone even asking the player's opinion. Players aren't asked. We're not asked. But let's change the calendar in some ways, you know, for, for an outside the tour event. Um, you're getting me at a time where it's very frustrating for me because we're fighting those fights every day. Yeah. And uh, it's hard for us. It's it's hard to build an event and continue that momentum that we continue to have. But at every turn, we're fighting a fight with a different um, organization. Well, let me ask you about that fight because you look at uh, you all's history of running a professional women's tournament, like a 700 level event mm -hmm. um, for a long time. Had you ever tried and considered running an ATP event? Oh yeah, if there was something on the schedule, we would jump on it tomorrow. But there's no there's no availability. Mm -hmm. There is no availability. We, we we would in a heartbeat, and we continue to look, and we continue to ask, and we continue to uh, probe because yeah, we, we we have just built a facility that should host bigger, better events, and we're going to continue to do that. We have we have one of the best events on tour, but we should have one of the best ATP events on tour, and we should have a combined event that could be better. You know, a first class experience for everyone. That's. We, we all have goals. That's definitely in our, uh, one of our goals. Now, one of the things that, you know, is always a discussion is, and since you're, you know, organizer, promoter, attendance at obviously Grand Slam events, which is co-gender. We've got attendance at ATP men's only events and attendance at WTA women's only events. Mm -hmm. What have you seen, right? And all of that, goes into the whole equal prize money kind of conversation yeah what do you what have you seen from an attendance standpoint relative because you run a wta only event relative to let's say houston which is an atp your men's only event yeah and that's and that's i would say it's a little unfair um brown one's a good friend of mine she's the tournament director down there um, <laughs> but that's a 250 on the on the men's side and you know i have a i have a stadium that can handle ten thousand fans and they have a stadium that they do a really great job with and they, and, but it's, I think 3,000, 3,500 fans. So, you know, the, the facilities itself, but I will say this, if you put me up against other um, 500 events, I think we hold our own. I mean, we do very well. It's um, and I, I could say right now, what our numbers look like for 2022 are blowing away anything we've ever done. So gives me a lot of belief in that we're going to continue this momentum. 2022 will be our best year without question. If we looked at everything today, our numbers are through the roof. So what can fans expect? What, what can fans, coaches, and players, because Charles is one of my favorite. Paul's is one of my favorite restaurants. <laughs> I, I eat oysters twice a year. Do you know, that's, that is part of my day. <laughs> is to make sure that I'm planning appropriately the reservations I have for players, coaches, fans, and then not fan, but VIPs who are coming in who say, hey, Bob, I need a reservation on this day. I have probably made five reservations in the last two days at Halls alone. And they do, <laughs> they, they, you know what, they love it. They're, they're great at what they do because of this. They, they've looked out for us for the last 10 years, making sure we have reservations and making sure we have a table held because they know our players love it and they treat people the way we treat people, which is we want, we have a smiling face. We want a great experience. They, they exude everything that we try and exude as a tournament. So to get off the halls piece, because you didn't start there. Uh, <laughs> now you've been, you've been coming here a long time and, you know, we had this nice little cozy cl clubhouse that served as, you know, player locker rooms, player lounge, massage therapy, stringer. <laughs> <laughs> everything was in this very small space so we on the back of the stadium just built a thirty-five thousand square foot um what we call stage house bottom floor brand new gym brand new locker rooms um new stringing room all by itself you know it's not behind one of my desks over here um the facilities are just beyond anything we could imagine i think players are going to be like i was trying to get maddie because maddie loves this madison keys for everyone who 
call, call her Maddie. And Maddie loves being uh, in the clubhouse. And I said, you can go there anytime you want. But I really, really believe you're going to love this new clubhouse or the new stage house that we're building for players. Top floor is player dining overlooking center court. You know, that's an experience they've never had a new um, a new player area in the back of that as well. So player dining, a player lounge that includes a golf simulator because Shelby Rogers and Ash Barty, <laughs> God, she's not joining us anymore. But those golfers who like to, you know, swing a golf club, we built the golf simulator up there for them. And I, Kamau, I am over the moon with the facilities and I really believe the players will be as well. I mean, the investment in the stadium is awesome on that side of things. Really special. So you brought up something that, that uh -oh. is a fine. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm a little nervous no, 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 that that I brought up something. <laughs> you brought up something that I find very interesting. And I think last year, I mean, as a coach, we always will set a schedule and change the schedule, mm -hmm. right? As things happen, whether it be injury or you play too many matches, we got further than we thought in a previous yeah. event. And, you know, during our 500 event, I think we had 23 of the top 25 come, mm -hmm. right? And, or, or enter. Sign and up. Then it, yep. Right, yeah. sign up, right? Then it, then it dropped to like, you know, 16 of the top 25, which is still Fantastic. great, right? Um, so your tournament in particular, right? How do you deal with a player field that is set and advertised, mm -hmm. right? And then you got the Sunshine Double, Indian Wells, Miami. And then you start to see some of the big names that you had hoped to get to fill this stadium sort of dwindle down. Yeah. I know I was just like crushed every day, every day, the new entry list would just come and you know, you get that little, that little nice, neat line crossed off by a name. Well, you know, you it? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's hard. And you, you, you know, I'm glad, you know, as a coach, the, turning into a tournament director, I'm glad you saw that and felt that because yeah. it's hard. <laughs> I've been doing this, you know, you know, as a tournament director, I think 12, 13 years now. And, you know, the young man at the tour, it's pretty funny. His name's Evan Charles. And Evan sends the update when someone withdraws. And, you know, like if I get another one this week, I'm going to write him a letter and said, you know, or I'll write him an email back. And I always joke about it. I said, Evan, that's it. Can't, I don't want to hear from you anymore. Right. You hate uh, his name to pop up in your inbox. When that pops up in my inbox, I get very, very disappointed. And because there's nothing else he's going to tell He's never going to tell me, hey, Bob. I'm going to add a player to your field. He's only here to tell me that a player is withdrawing. Right. Um, and we've already had that. You know, we've lost two Grand Slam champions this week. It, and that's hard. They were leaders of our field. The good news is I'm about to announce a new Grand Slam champion coming in as a top 20 wild card and another top 10 player coming in as a top 20 wild card. So, you know, usually come out, it's this week coming up where we get really hurt. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, right. But, you know, when we lost a couple of players last week, we were able to go and, and I was in Miami, was able to talk to some players and do some recruiting. And, you know, I had time to deal with it. Um, usually I don't have time to deal with it because of injuries, because of, uh, you know, surfaces, different things that come up. We get that. Um, I think the stronger field you have to start, the stronger field you're going to have even after you get some hits. Right. Um, but as much planning and effort as we put into what happens in between the lines you know we put just as much effort on what happens outside the lines and you know and and, and to me it's about number 100 in the world's a really good player number 50 in the world is a really good player just billy jean king said that she was on a call and we were doing world team tennis and and, and uh, a reporter said you know billy jean with world team tennis why would you think someone would come would come to see a player number 75 in the world? And she goes, who's this? And he said, well, my name's so-and-so. I'm a reporter. She goes, James, why do you think the 75 best female player in the world at something she chooses to do isn't worth seeing? And man, I took that to heart. And so we put a lot of effort into promoting not just the top 10. We're going to promote every player that comes on our grounds because they deserve it, number one. But number two, my God, they're really good at what they do. I mean, I look at a lot of events and their qualities weekend is their prep weekend. Our qualities weekend is real. We, we will have 5,000 people here, guaranteed, no question about it. And those players are fighting to make the main draw. And it's really good tennis. And as you know, they're fighting to make a paycheck and make some and earn some points. Right. And so we take this at opening Saturday, Sunday, where others may just say, Hey, we're going to, the qualities are going on. We're going to prep the area. We're going to build our stands. No way. 
we'll be ready Saturday and Sunday to promote that tennis and take it seriously. And because they deserve that too. And they're the future stars of tennis. So we really hope that every effort we make continues to promote the game, promote those players who are up and coming, the players who are currently top 10. We, we're going to work really hard to make sure that everyone recognizes how valuable our whole field is as opposed to just a top 10 field. And um, sometimes that's hard because people relate top 10, but I guarantee you it, the more people that come out and see, I don't care if it's 30 play and number 12, you're going to see great tennis. And uh, that's what we really work hard at doing, promoting all of tennis. Well, let's think about women's tennis, right? Because I think that women's tennis uh, over the past, let's say five or six years has become very unpredictable. We've seen a yeah. lot of young people, no kidding. you know, win their first Grand Slam. And when I look at your tournament in particular, right, I think, you know, back in the day, Chris Everett won five years in a row. Tracy Austin won two years in a row. Navratilova won two years in a row. And then Skippy Year won another year. Skippy Year won another year. And then Serena won two years in a row. But over the past six years, you haven't had a repeat champion. Yep. And so, A, to me, that's women's tennis right now. Anybody that shows up, can win but b that also presents a great product right because on the men's side you look at the field you pretty much know this is pass and the doll if he's here medvedev is here if he's here um zverev if he's here novak if he's here all right four of those guys are going to be here in the last two days right on women's tennis you actually don't know right you don't know it's uh and so you know, that's a reason for people to actually watch women's tennis because from a betting standpoint, it's really exciting, right? You can really, not that betting is a thing in tennis, right? I but, can't talk about that. Right. So it's like, <laughs> it's, so, it's so unpredictable, Yeah. right? But the product is so good because watching Djokovic is great, mm -hmm. but watching Djokovic play Chorich, you know, it's going to end one way. Right. Right. Like to almost anything. And so I think that women's tennis as a product uh, should promote that parity. Yeah. You know, yeah, and I think absolutely. that when you look at your field and the depth of your field and the fact that for the past six, seven years, there has been a new champion. Yeah. Um, that is something I think is a reason for people to like kind of watch. Kind of watch. Now, I'll tell you what, come on, just going back to what are we what are the things we do? One of the most important difference makers for us because Washington, D.C. did it first and then we were second and it was a partnership with Tennis Channel. All right. What made a difference for me? And I, rem I remember talking to, to Ken and negotiating a deal. I, you know, a whole week you're going to be broadcasting from Charleston. So we have a week to showcase our event. We have a week to showcase our city. We have a week to bring it to life. But what was really important on that deal for me was. And, I, and there was a negotiating point. I said, I want the desk there every day. And I want live commentators there every day. And when a player wins, they're coming off that court. And they're going to go to the desk and talk about that. That And guess what? People get to, people become fans of players. And to your point, I will go back. And it was Daria Kasatkina winning. All right. Daria at that moment in time wasn't even a top 30 and um, she was playing Ostapenko, who at that time was not in the top 30. And I wake up and I'm go to bed Saturday night going, oh, my God, who's going to come and who's going to watch? Right. Because I don't have a top 20 player, let alone. A top and she's not American. Player. Right. And, and she's not, not American. American. And but what I realized is. People got to know those players through that week. Now, I've showed up Sunday and guess what? We had a great crowd. Awesome crowd. And you know what? Our numbers were really good on Tennis Channel. And I go back and I say, why? And I think because we're able to storytell that whole week. We're able to let the players storytell that whole week. Kasakina got to meet Tennis Channel fans for six days, five days. She won five matches, right? So every day she wins, she gets on. People get to know her, get to see who she is. And I think there's like that. there was a lot of value there. And I tell and I thank Ken every time. Ken, Ken Solomon with Tennis Channel. I said, this is why we've grown these couple years, we have ticket holders coming from 49 states this year, 49 states coming to Charleston. We have a great city. We have a great tournament, great food, as you know, <laughs> you know, all of those things come into play. 
but it's because we're able to storytell that whole week about what Daniel Island is, what Charleston is, what our, who our players are, let them tell their stories. That has made a difference for us. And, and it does not go overlooked by me. It's, it's what has changed the game for us. Well, the year before she won Charles, she won Charles in 2017. Yep. 2016 semifinals. She played the player I was coaching. Mm-hmm. And missed an inside out forehand just wide. Yeah. But she was on, on match point. Yep. She was a match point away from being in the finals and probably was a better matchup for Vestalina. So she probably would have won the tournament in 16 yep. if that ball had not been thankfully out. Yep. Um, so I, we definitely knew when she won in 17, it was, you know, not a surprise. I actually watched that match because Sloan was there on a the boot. Mm-hmm. Commentating. That's right. That's right. Yep. So I, I remember that year very vividly. So let's talk about remembering years. There's a lot that goes wrong behind the scenes of an event, right? I say last year, everybody knows the world was struggling to find tennis balls. And our shipment of tennis balls was delayed and untraceable, untrackable. So Mm -hmm. I hopped in my car and drove to Milwaukee to buy a bunch of regular duty U.S. Open tennis balls. Tell me about your most memorable damn, this was going to be a bad situation, but we saved it. Well, I, I don't know if we saved it. It was one of those things. You know what? There's things you can control and things you can't control. And usually the things you can't control are players, right? If they're injured or win or, lo- win or lose, you can't control that. And the weather, can't control that. So, you, you know, kind of put those in the box and you know you're as a tournament director for an outdoor event, you're going to deal with those things. Now, you know, there's this bridge that goes over top of our facility, you know, over to the left here, right? I yeah. think it was year one or year two, a truck got stuck up there and then the car hit a propane truck and these propane things started to blow up up there. <laughs> and now that's not on our site, it has nothing to do with us, It's but it's, it's relatively close. So they came in and shut us down because they didn't know what was going to happen with the propane <laughs> truck on the bridge. We're, we had to evacuate the clubhouse, evacuate courts one, two, three, actually courts one through 12. And get everyone over to stadium and had to stop play. Mid match, stop play. Mid match, had to stop play and evacuate people. And, and what did TV do? Did they like? TV yeah, didn't know what to do. Night. No one knew what to do. And everyone's like, "What's going on?" We didn't know. And then someone said, "What's going on?" And I'll never forget, Mr. Williams, Richard Williams. He at that time he was the photographer. He's up there taking photos and taking pictures of everything. And I'm like, Mr. Williams, <laughs> yeah, gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> So it was, uh, that was the year that you just didn't know, you know, like, wow, that's something you can't plan for. That's something you can't do anything about. It just happened. So that was, that was the one that, yeah, that was, wow. You got to deal with, but boy, you, you didn't see that coming at all. Oh man. So how do you, I mean, first of all, I think when you talk about what players, when they're changing the schedule, mm-hmm. I will say from the other side, People are very reluctant to change on Bob and Eleanor, right? They feel <laughs> like they feel like this undying loyalty to you guys because of the energy and the effort that you put into the event. I will say that from this, I've been a fly on the wall in many conversations, and it's like, damn, I don't, I got to do it for Bob and Eleanor. I got to go, I, you know, that kind of thing. So, how do you work on this all year? Do you work on this all year? Because the way that it comes off. It's like every day that year you're working on this event. Well, we do. There, there's no question that we work on this event. And the relationships are important to us. They are. Um, you know, I, I want to think that everything we do is authentic. We're not doing anything because of any other reason than we love what we do. And we also love that the players enjoy themselves here. Um, you know, and we listen. Come on, I think that's really important to listen to players. You know, I listen to players when they tell us, You know, we'll do things you need us to do, but it needs to be important. It needs to be well thought out. And I'm talking about like an ace when when players are they have responsibilities to go do a meet and greet or, you know, and I think in a lot of events, they're just checking boxes. Right. All right. We got this. um, So and so you need to go here to take care of this sponsor visit. Right. There's no thought put into it. Right. So, you know, we just had a meeting earlier today and I said when we were planning out our aces, if someone's going, we need to send someone ahead. There better be 20 to 30 people and not two people. 
Right. All right. Because I listened to the players. They said their most frustrating point is when they give their time to do something, they don't feel like it's important and there's no one there or something to that effect. So mm-hmm. those are the little things that we want to make sure we do. And if, you know, if we need something very rarely has a player said no to us because we will go that extra mile, be it a reservation at a hotel, be it a, you know, a bottle of wine that we know there's someone who likes a bottle of wine that we'll make sure they have when they leave. Um, all these little things that we want to do. And uh, Eleanor Adams and my team, I give her all the credit in the world because all year she's continuing to build those relationships. And um, and it's important. And even in, you know, the, the council meetings, the player and tournament council meetings this week, you know, I, I really committed myself to listening to the players and, and, and Sloan did a great job. And um, Vika did a great job of expressing what we need to do as a tour, because you know what? A lot of people don't, I read message boards all the time. I shouldn't, but I do. And the message boards, you know, they, they talk about the WTA, right? I don't think anyone realizes that as the WTA, that's the body that basically works for the tour, which is owned by the players and by the tournaments. All right. We are, we, the players own the tour. We own the tour and we have to work together to get better. It's not easy. But our job is to listen to each other and hopefully get to better places. And um, a lot of what, what, what frustrates me is when I lead, read things, they don't understand that. The general fan doesn't understand that players and tournaments are equal partners on the WTA tour. Well, I think that that goes back to what you were talking about, because when you asked me the questions of who owns the tour, I said the players. Right. Yeah. But again, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Who runs tennis? Um, yeah. But I do think from just a pure business model standpoint, it is very mythical on who, who runs tennis, who's pulling the strings, right? Who's the, you know, who, who has sort of the power per se. And I live in Chicago. Yep. And so this is the Windy City, right? And like, this is the <laughs> city where, where do you want to, you want to decide whether you want to be the politician or you want to be the man behind the politician, right? right? And I think that from a tour standpoint, it is really hard to unpack who's really in control, but that's neither here nor there. I will say one of the things I want to A, commend you on was during COVID, right? And mm-hmm. then B, how did you make it through it? Because I think, you know, a lot of events came on just because there was help from the tour to put on events during COVID. Yep. Um, but what did that do to your business? And are you looking, obviously you got to subsidize, subsidize yourself as well as the tour steps up. But, you know, I wonder like, this is like, you haven't been there in three years. Well, fans haven't been able to come in almost three years. Yep. And so, you know, tennis is still a business, right? And, and having these events last is that, is this year going to be, hey, we're going to make up from COVID, right? And hopefully break even and start fresh in 2023. How did you survive? Or, are you, or have you even made it back to the black yet? Yeah. So number one, I have an unbelievable owner. We, you know, in normal world, we wouldn't be here without ownership like we had. The, the Navarro family and Ben specifically was, you know, unbelievably supportive of us in that time with my team. We couldn't run an event. You know, at that moment in time, we had nothing to do. What he, he came back to me, he goes, Bob, we're going to come out of this, but what do we do? And we didn't know what was going to happen with the tour. That's why we created that made for TV event with Tennis Channel as our partner. And that's where we were introduced to Credit One, our new title sponsor. Um, was he challenged? He said, let's go figure something out. And that was, you know, 16 players, no fans, made for TV, having some fun. It was probably the most fun I've had as a tournament director because it was just really everyone just trying to get back to some normalcy. Um, And then the following year, you know, again, we never thought we'd be sitting in the same place about possibly not having an event, let alone definitely not having fans. And, um, you know, again, the tour came to us and said, what about a 250? Because we lost all those other events. Can we make up for some? So number one, I went to Ben and asked him, are we okay with doing this? And, and my, our reasons were simple. Give the players a place to play. Give them a chance to make a living. And let's be a good WTA partner. Right? And we're, we're, in, a, we, we, we're in a place where we could do that. And, but without the leadership that we had, there's no way we would ever be able to do that. It would be very difficult to be here today. Um, and at that moment in time, when we knew we were going to be down, that's when we started discussions about the renovations of this beautiful new facility that we're going to be 
showcasing here. Uh, whew, six days. <laughs> we're putting seats in right now. Come on. We are putting seats in right now. And they're beautiful uh -oh. seats, but that's what we're doing today. Oh, I know uh, how it goes. So let me ask you. <laughs> Credit so, One, uh, new, new title sponsor. Yeah. Well, two, two things. One, I remember um, Sloan and I, flight got delayed. We landed at midnight. We're like, transport ends at 10. What are we going to do? It was like, oh, okay. They said someone would be there to pick us up. And lo and behold, <laughs> it, was it was you, right? <laughs> so that, that's part of that undying loyalty to Bob, right? He comes and picks us up at midnight, right? And, and I'm sure he was doing other things. Um, but, but two, am I getting a Volvo this year? Since Credit One is a title sponsor. Yeah. Are, are, are players and coaches still getting Volvos? The beautiful thing is, you know, Volvo, you know, it was a tough time for corporate sponsors in, in COVID too. And, you know, especially in the car business at that moment in time, getting product built and created. And they, they came to us and asked, you know, hey, this is going to be tough for us. We came up with a solution. So they're still our official vehicle. I've got out my door there. I've got 30 brand new Volvos sitting in my parking lot. Yeah, there'll be Volvos out there. All right. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. We'll take the XC90 black, black interior. <laughs> I will do everything I can. I don't know if I can control color or the <laughs> interior, but it will be an XC90. Oh, man. Yep. Well, man, I, I really appreciate you. Um, I'm looking forward to coming, looking forward to, you know, seeing the new stadium. Uh, I got a couple of rapid fire questions for you. How many towels did you order? <laughs> <laughs> At least 2,000 too many. <laughs> hey, and come out, just so to be clear, we have a brand new laundry room that has two commercial grade dryers because <laughs> towels are everything. <laughs> everything. I mean, how, how many bottles of water did you order? Oh, God, a never ending stock. How many of your sports drinks did you order? <laughs> never ending stock. We will never run out. <laughs> hey, you know that's that's spoken like a fellow td to know to ask those questions oh. i know where these questions are coming from come on i get it <laughs> well bob thank you for your time today i know you're busy i know you got requests you got restaurant reservations to make airport <laughs> pickups to to coordinate so i appreciate you taking the time and you know this has been a tennis.com podcast with bob moran who runs the longest standing or longest running women's only event on the U.S. soil. Not easy to do. So, you know, the players, the coaches, the tours, forever grateful for everything that you do and continue to do. And we wish you a lot of success these next couple of weeks. Well, Kamal, number one, thanks for doing what you're doing here. This is great to promote the game of tennis. And number two, can't wait to see you in very few days. Looking forward <laughs> to it, my friend. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.